Welcome to This One Life. Today on the show, Dr. Stacy Sims. Stacy is an exercise physiologist and nutrition scientist. She has directed research programs at Stanford, AUT University, and the University of Waikato, focusing on female athlete health and performance. She's also a recognized speaker and author. Learn how effective specific supplements are like glutamine, ashwagandha, collagen and adaptogens, creatine, melatonin, and why most of the women don't get positive effects from whey protein supplementation, although they could with the right dosage. This has been a fantastic conversation, both entertaining and incredibly insightful. Enjoy. Often when you talk about supplementation, not you, people generally talk about supplementation, I'm worried that two dangerous things come together. One is an obsession with performance and results, and that combined with uh, short attention spans and the feeling you should get results overnight. A, a big part of the supplement industry feels to be fueled by the pitfall to neglect the basics and hope to find shortcuts through supplements. Is yeah. there a very simple way for you to say, okay, look, supplements can make 5% of your health and performance and 95% of all the basics, or is it 10% or is it 3%? Do you have any rough guideline to give us here? No, I don't have a percentage to give you. I always look at it as you need to be a healthy athlete. And so if you have all the metrics of health and you're eating a really good diet and you're able to adapt to your training, then we look at supplementation. What are the issues that we're having and what kind of supplements can we use to support that? So if you are a healthy athlete and you're wanting to compete in regional CrossFit games or you wanna do obstacle course racing or you wanna do high rocks, and you have to do these really hard multiple sessions of high anaerobic capacity, and then you have to do a big block of strength. But we want to support that with specific supplementation. We want to look at how are we going to implement protein dosing throughout the day to make sure you have enough amino acids for recovery and lean mass development. We want to see that between those workouts within a day that we might be supplementing the second workout with some beta alanine or maybe some bicarb to help you get more out of that anaerobic capacity. Because again, like I said, the whole goal of training is to hit a training metric or training stress to adapt to it. So if we're putting heavy loads in certain points, then we can use supplements to help get to that top end point. But it's not about using it all of the time, which I think is the disconnect that people have. They're like, this is my pill and supplement routine. I have to take these every day. And most of the time, people don't realize why they are taking them and the fact that you do better when your body is trying to learn that stress itself. And the supplements are there to supplement and help with that extra top end. And we see a lot of problems with elite and professional athletes who are trying to get that extra edge. And they're just drawn in by marketing dollars. Like you see them supposedly drinking Powerade and Gatorade. Those are supplements, but they don't do anything for you. As a matter of fact, they can effectively dehydrate you. Or you might see someone going, I want to use this Hemo Rage pre-workout because it makes me so ready for the gym. And then they realize that, oh, I'm going to test positive because there's some hidden things in there that I didn't realize. And they don't really need to use it. If they look and say, I need to be ready for a pre-workout, pre-works is just ca caffeine that's been stacked with something else. So have two shots of espresso and I, I don't know if you're a man, have some beet juice. If you're a woman, have some beta alanine and boom, good to go. We at Freeletics run test groups and boot camps. So test groups are mostly focused on how do they react to different types of programming and nutrition protocols and boot camps are actually, okay, let's get to it and within three or five months, how can how much can we boost your performance? How much can we how much can we change your physique? And with, with very good results. And we have a very clear hierarchy that we tell the people when it comes to because this topic always comes up: supplementation. What should I take to improve my results? And the hierarchy is we have a pyramid, and that's a five-step pyramid. 
and supplements is really the last part of that pyramid. So the first basic is calories. Like whatever you want to do, you need to get your calories. And if you want to lose weight, you have to be below your calories. If you want to gain muscle, you have to be above. Um, and the second thing is macros. Then the third thing is quality of the food. So we always discuss where's quality of the food. Is that before macros or after? You can argue that, but so either on second or on third, it's quality of the food. In parallel. They're in parallel building that same band. That, that's Then it's not so easy to market. We're talking about marketing here again. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> so, so let's say ca calories, then in parallel you have macros and quality. Then we think about micronutrients in the food. And then only afterwards, at the last point, we think about supplements. And before you don't have the other things properly managed and in place, you don't have to think about supplements that's our philosophy exactly that's exactly how it is i remember when interbike the big bike show in the states used to be in las vegas and i jumped in a cab to get from the trade show to the airport to fly home and this guy jumped in and this is when i was racing bikes so i had like my team jacket on so he started talking to me about bikes And he was talking about how he gets up and he tries to ride every day and he does his caffeine and his beta alanine and his beet juice and he goes off and he goes for his ride. Now, the picture in my head, I want to describe being PC, but it's not going to come out that way. The guy who got in the cab with me was, I'd say in his upper 60s, very robust, red face and a bulbous nose indicating that he drinks a lot, very big beer belly. And then he's telling me that he rides 10 miles a day after taking his caffeine and his beta alanine and his beet juice. And I was like, I'm sure there's a whole lot of other things that we should be doing first before we're using those supplements. <laughs> I get that picture. Yes. <laughs> yes. A, a, a big part of what I actually taken that's not even really a supplement it's just you as a bike in ex much more experience in endurance sports this but for example these small gel pa gel packages that basically are almost purely carbs purely sugar or something like that if i do a, a, if i do a run that goes more than 10 miles sometimes i start to become dizzy in my head i go low in blood sugar i it's easy very convenient to have that in your pocket you just pull it out you take it five minutes afterwards you have i think there's a lot to 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 these kind of things but it's not really supplementation it is making certain macronutrients available when your body needs them in a very convenient way not more yeah and then that's part of the problem with with the whole supplement industry is they'll throw sport nutrition in as sport supplements and then everything that's listed under sports supplements goes from sports drinks gels glucose tablets all the way to the extreme pre-workouts or you know, use this hyper hydration fuel for your bike rides and All the things that really, if you were just to stick to the basics, you wouldn't even consider these things over here because they don't add anything. Matter of fact, this is why people end up with so many issues because of the stuff that they're taking and they're not really realizing why or how it affects them. What do you think about a potential placebo effect when it comes to supplementation? Oh, yeah, for sure. We see that in the research all the time. And when you're like, use it on our kids all the time too, right? Oh, if you eat this, you'll be a super person. But it works the same with athletes too, right? We see this with a younger athlete in a coach situation where the coach is, is, finds really good efficacy with a particular brand or supplement and then says to his athletes, hey, yeah, you should be using this in this way. And the athlete doesn't question it. They just use it and they think that it works for them. Whether or not it does is a different story. I see that a lot with endurance athletes who leave nutrition to the last minute. And then they're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And they might be in an expo or the coach might say, hey, you should try this. And this will make you go really fast in the second half of your race. Because it's in their brain, it may or may not actually make them go faster Most likely it doesn't because it's the first time they've ever used it, but in their head it does. So we see it a lot and it's a big, huge area and robust research in the psychological literature about the placebo effect. So you could say that 
okay if you randomly take one of the commonly available advertised supplements chances are not bad that at best it does nothing for you and just you just pee it out but if you take the placebo effect into account there might be actually something to it but you but that would then just be based on belief yeah exactly yeah I like it when you have metrics. So if we see all the like adaptogens that are out there and all the sleep products that are out there, you can actually have a physiological measurement to see if it's working or not. So if we're looking at sleep and we're looking at tart cherry juice or L-theanine, you can use wearables and see your sleep architecture and how that changes. If we're looking at adaptogens to counter stress and cortisol, you can see that through mood changes. You can also see that in sleep and parasympathetic drive with your heart rate variability. So there are things that you can measure from just things that you're using at home. But when we're talking about those top end performance supplements, a lot of that is that placebo effect. Uh, you have mentioned adaptogens, and, and there is somewhat a rise of adaptogenic supplements and the belief in their potential to combat stress and enhance energy and improve mental clarity, especially marketed to w women. What do you generally think about adaptogens? And when we think about sleep, what are some of the things you would look at first in terms of supplementation if you want to look into supplementation for sleep? So I love adaptogens. And I say that with a caveat in the fact that there's only a few that have peer review, complementary alternative medicine, RCT work behind it. We also can include medicinal mushrooms in the adaptogen category. So we're looking at reishi, we're looking at lion's mane, cordyceps, those kinds of things. So when we're looking at why it's being marketed at, at women, it's primarily being marketed to the 30 plus set because of the stress compounding aspects that a lot of women are complaining about or do experience. So if we look at what adaptogens do, I'll explain to people what an adaptogen is. If we look at some of these plants that these adaptogen compounds come from, they are plants that are in stressful environments. For example, Indian ginseng grows at high altitude. And because you have severe weather changes and it becomes really cold, and then sometimes you'll have some really severe heat from the sun, the plant itself has compounds within it that allows it to survive. So these adaptogenic properties come from specific plants that have these ability to survive in extreme conditions. So if we look at ashwagandha, which is another popular one, ashwagandha has withanoids, which is the plant compound that works with your body's stress system to understand how much cortisol is being produced, how sensitive you are to that. And it will read it and be like, okay, there's a lot of cortisol, but we don't need to be as sensitive. So I'm going to downregulate some of these cortisol receptors. So I don't get as much of a <gasps> feeling from the stress. We also see that it works with thyroid and thyroid hormone production. So if you are a bit low in thyroid, production, thyroid hormone production, ashwagandha can help boost it up and make your body more sensitive to it. So it's not like taking a pharmaceutical agent where it's masking or replacing something. Adaptogen's whole idea is to work with the body system itself. So it becomes a unique experience for every person that uses it. So I could be using ashwagandha and your wife could be using ashwagandha and we're both stressed out but her stress is triggered by something else and then what's triggered by me and her stress might be interfering with her sleep where my stress might be interfering with my ability to think clearly. So the ashwagandha is going to work differently to mitigate the stress and we both end up in a better state. It is so difficult to figure out for you individually whether you should take a supplement and if so, in what dosage. I, I had, I was taking ashwagandha because of, I don't know, stress is maybe the wrong word because stress always feels so negative, but as an entrepreneur, there's a lot going on in, in your life together with family and, and all of these things. And I just felt that something that would help me in a natural way to calm down a bit better in the evening would help me. And I did have the feeling that it, that 
it helped me with that. However, but obviously I didn't do any study. There could be that could be correlation, just correlation. But it felt that my mood was a bit more melancholic, maybe for lack of a better word. So my 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 mood was not as good as as happy as I used to be. And then I started to dig into some of the research on ashwagandha it, it felt that there were there, there were some st streams of research and, and some experience reports and again experience reports you have to be very careful about them but that that also at least hinted towards yes there could be an effect of mood and if ashwagandha is all basically overcoming you it could also downregulate your, your mood and so i stopped using it again it's have you tried ro rhodiola no i haven't you should try that because Ashwagandha ends up being the one that people have the most side effects to. It can cause mood disruption. It can cause dry mouth and dizziness. Rhodiola doesn't have any reported side effects, but it works similarly with regards to down-regulating stress symptomology. It's one of the things that I use when I travel because coming from New Zealand to Europe and the jet lag and all that kind of stuff, wherever I am in the world half an hour before I have to go to bed, whatever time zone, it's 200 milligrams of L-theanine and 600 milligrams of rhodiola. And both of those together really work to activate parasympathetic response for me. So I can get into a really good deep sleep, even if I've just landed in a new time zone. And so I find that rhodiola stacked with L-theanine, which is not an adaptogen, but those two work really well for me. Very interesting. I'm going to take that down as a note and try that. What do you think about, I'm blanking on that name, this very popular s sleep supplement? Melatonin? Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, my personal, again, personal experience, I don't want to make this too much about personal experience, but I use, when you talked about traveling, I use that when I travel, go intercontinental, and it seemed to help me, but I was always very cautious in taking it regularly. So I only take it on when I do have these jet lag issues. Yeah. So melatonin is uh, somewhat of a pharmaceutical because your brain naturally produces it and it is involved in sleep. But the dosage for melatonin, because you can just buy like 100 or 200 milligram melatonin pills, we don't know if that's too much or too little. So some people will take melatonin and they'll wake up feeling hungover. And, and there has been some studies that is looking, yes, it's good at resetting circadian rhythm in men, maybe not so much in women because there's a difference in circadian rhythm length. And if you use it on a regular basis, then you end up not being able to fall asleep and stay asleep as well as if you didn't use it because your brain has become more reliant on the pill intake. This is why I, I love L-theanine because L-theanine is a non-protein amino acid that works with the GABA system in the brain to really activate alpha waves in the parasympathetic response. It's not a hormone that's going to invoke you to fall asleep. It's actually involved in the process of sleep architecture. And there is not a side effect to it because it's something that your body naturally uses in its build up to falling asleep, getting into that slow wave sleep, and it doesn't doesn't have any of those side effects. It's similar to an adaptogen with the fact that it's not a pharmaceutical to replace something in your body. It actually works with the body systems. I will check that out. It, it sounds like the better choice. Let's see whether that works yeah. for me. Let's see if it works, yeah. <laughs> Last one on the specific supplements, but also because there's just such a massive surge in marketing for collagen supplements. Yeah. Again, especially for women, but also to a certain extent for men who you, you know who have a lot of physical stress on the body to to help them recover. It gives the perception that your joints will recover better and all of these kind of things. What do you think about collagen? So there's a, a misstep in the information around collagen because there's actually two kinds that you should be looking at using if you are going to use it. There is some really good evidence that's coming out to show that if you're using the combination of undenatured whole collagen and collagen peptides, they work to reduce the pain and the increased degradation of joint cartilage. So it helps with early stages of osteoarthritis and the stiffness that comes with osteoarthritis. 
when we're looking at what is undenatured collagen versus peptides, most of the marketing is around peptides. They're talking about how we've broken up this massively long molecule or strand of collagen so that it can be easily digested. Yes, that's true. And then the peptide will go to target tissue and it can help in, in certain situations, depending on if it's a type one, a type three, or a type two. If you're looking for a joint, you want type two because that is the type that actually works for cartilage in the joint. Type one and three, which is what's primarily marketed and sold, it's just for skin, hair, and nails. But if you are eating jello or you're eating or drinking bone broth, then you're gonna get the same thing. You don't have to buy it. But whole collagen is not digested. The body cannot absorb it. But what it does do is when it gets into the small intestines, it causes an immune response, but a positive immune response where it's telling the immune system not to attack cartilage and cartilage tissue. So it stops and slows down the rate of decay of that cartilage tissue. So if you are looking for joint help with collagen, then yes, you want to use undenatured and peptides together because you're getting a, a response in the body to stop breaking down your own cartilage and you're getting um, little bits to help rebuild the cartilage that's there. When we see all of these beauty products that are out there that take collagen for great skin, I'm like, you can, but you can also get it from food. Unless, of course, you're vegetarian or vegan, but then you can use collagen boosters. Go right down to the source, like what brings up and builds cartilage. It's not just the helical structure of the amino acids that are in cartilage, but it's zinc, copper, and vitamin C. Those are the things that you really want to make sure you have in your diet that's going to help build your own natural collagen. Are there any... Oh upcoming supplements or supplements that get a new boost of research and attention that so far might not be robust enough or not yet well enough understood to be put on your top list for people to take, but that you are following or that you are excited about learning more? I can't really say off the top of my head, except for lion's mane. So lion's mane is a medicinal mushroom. And we're seeing some really cool information coming out about brain health and the neural growth factor. So if we think about what happens as we get older, everyone thinks that they're going to end up with Alzheimer's and dementia. This isn't true. You, there are things that you can do to stop it, even if you have a, a family history. One is resistance training, of course, because then you're building new neural pathways. But they're showing that using lion's mane mushroom, you can buy it, it looks like this big fuzzy head and you can chop it up and put it in your stir fries or you can use it as a supplement. It has really good research coming out to show that it slows down Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So I'm really interested from a health perspective of having more robust research come out about that as well as helping with some early stages of multiple sclerosis or MS. Very interesting. I'm also very passionate about the topic of brain health. And as you mentioned, de dementia, I do want to give credit to a, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Dr. Tommy Wood on the show, who is very focused on researching, for example, brain health. And he mentioned many of the things that you mentioned too. And w one thing he mentioned in addition to help prevent dementia or just general cognitive de decline. And I found it so intuitive that I am not getting tired to repeat that is um, brain stimulus. So just making sure that you keep the stimulus up for your brain. He compared that to trying to build muscle, where if you want to build muscle and you make sure that your sleep is great, your food is great, your supplementation is great, all of these things are great. But if you don't lift weights, you will not get more muscular. And so his analogy then going back to brain health was you can make sure that you have great nutrition, no environmental toxins and and all of these things but if you don't stimulate your brain so make sure that you continue to learn new things get challenged all of that is the same as in the gym example 
Yeah, <laughs> I love it. It's great. That's why you see all the little Sudoku books around and Wordle and all those other, like little brain teaser puzzles. And and I'm ageist when I say this, but the older like 60 plus set, they're all in doing their Sudoku and everything because they're like, I got to challenge my brain. But when you're an entrepreneur and you're teaching and everything, you're always learning and always thinking and getting that stimulus. So when we stop working, we're going to be doing those Sudokus. Yeah, he, there's... This point in time when you when you retire, or at least normal people retire and they stop step out of workforce, that's when you see a lot of these de dementia and cognitive decline things accelerate because this big stimulus on your brain just dro drops out. And also, we were yeah. talking about that at least on population level, your your brain health peaks somewhere in in mid twenties around because to some extent because of physical reasons, but mostly at that age, because in your late teens and early 20s, this is when you, when the average person gets most of their mental stimulus. They learn so much, they see so much, they travel, they study, they go through different jobs and all of these kind of things. And the more you progress in life, the more you focus on one career, the more you stay in one geography, the more you already know the trade, how you do your work and the challenge and the stimulus re reduces. And that's why then also brain health generally reduces. Decline. Very fascinating yeah. topic. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to have to listen to that one. <laughs> Stacy, this episode as the last one was uh, fantastic, both entertaining and extremely informative for the listeners who did not have the chance yet to listen to our first joint episode. Where should listeners go to learn more about you and your work? The biggest place is our website. So drdrstacysims.com. So that has the list of all the courses we're doing. You can go media page and find all the stuff that I've been doing. Sign up for a free blog and newsletter because I put something out every couple of weeks with new research topics to Instagram and Facebook. If you still use it, Dr. Stacy Sims. So yeah, I'm out there in the ether space. So come find me. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to the show. I would love to get your comments, suggestions, and feedback. Also, if there's a special topic you would like me to address or someone specific you'd love to see on the show. If you want to support me, please hit the subscribe button and leave me a rating. I hope you will listen in again on the next show. Until then, all the best.